All right, welcome back. So we've been talking a lot so far about macro in the long run and economic growth. And today we're going to start pivoting to the second part of the semester where we talk about macro in the short run, specifically business cycles. So this is a graph of the money supply in the United States from about 1920 to about 1960. And what you see in this graph is that it goes up pretty steadily except for one spot, right around 1930 to 1934. Now what's going on between 1930 and 1934? Well, the Great Depression is going on. Right, so here's the puzzle that we want to explore in this unit. What does monetary policy have to do with things like unemployment? And why would a fall in the money supply make it harder for these guys to find a job? Now, one thing we saw in the lectures on macroeconomic growth is that economic growth is very steady in the long run. Right, we had that graph with the uh, relatively steady increase, about a 2 or 3% increase per year for several hundred years, with really the only major interruption during the Great Depression. But if we zoom in, it's a lot bumpier. It looks very smooth if we zoom out. But when we zoom in, it fluctuates around that uh, very straight trend. So we're going to call these business cycles. And business cycles happen about every 5 to 20 years, and they cycle between recession and booms. Right? Now, recessions are characterized by unemployment, by underemployment, by things that uh, could be being used but aren't being used. And what we're going to want to know is what prevents these resources from being used effectively. Now, recessions are kind of a puzzle, right? We talked about in one of the homeworks, talked about developing your sense of surprise. And one of the concepts that ought to hone your sense of surprise is this idea of arbitrage, right? We had a homework question, why is it surprising that there would be a price difference between New York City and Dallas for cars, right? If you see cars with different prices in two different places, that's surprising. Why? Because that implies an opportunity, or it may imply an opportunity, to buy low and sell high. And that's how we get our law of one price, right? Recessions are surprising for exactly the same reason. Right, so one thing we see during recessions is that not only is there unemployment of labor, but there's also unemployment of capital and investment goods. Right, so you see things like underutilized factories. Now, suppose that you see a factory out there that could be producing something, but isn't. What can you do as an entrepreneurial uh, young person? Well, same thing that the farmer did in the, uh, the previous uh, lectures. Right? If you see something and you know that you can use it more effectively than it's currently being used, you can go to the bank and get a loan. Right? And you say, well, I don't necessarily know what the most productive use for this factory is, but I'm pretty sure that the most efficient use is not just sitting there doing nothing. And if I turn out anything out of this factory, I'm going to be doing more than it's doing right now. So why shouldn't I be able to go to the bank, get a loan, buy this factory, and make these resources flow to their most valued uses? You'd think, right? But you're not actually able to do that. And people don't do that during a recession. So one of our questions is going to be, why not? What's preventing them? Just the same way that we had to ask the question, why not, when we saw a cost of living difference between New York City and Dallas. Right? Why don't people arbitrage that away? Similarly, why don't people arbitrage away these unemployed resources? Why is it hard for them to do that? And why do we see these unemployed resources during recessions? Because there's an opportunity here, right? There's an opportunity for value creation, for resources to be used more efficiently than they're being used. But for some reason, that's not happening. So we're going to have to figure out why. Now, I want to impress upon you that recessions are not an equilibrium, right? Recessions are disequilibria. And that's not an explanation of our previous question, right? That's just another way of stating it. So remember equilibrium 
we defined in general as a stable point. And specifically in economics, a stable point where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And we say that markets clear in equilibrium. Why? Because whenever we're in disequilibrium, there are forces that kick in that give people incentives to raise prices or lower prices such that quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Right? Everybody has the incentive to set their prices in that way, and that's how we get efficient allocations of resources. But in recessions, that's not happening. Right? Recessions are a disequilibrium where we have quantity demanded less than quantity supplied. We have surpluses. Right? People are not demanding all the things that exist. Why not? And the other half of business cycles we're going to call booms. Right? In a boom, we have shortages. And we have quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded. Right? Both of these things are disequilibria. Both of these things are not permanent, and there will be forces that kick in to lead to either coming down from the boom or recovering from the recession. But it takes a while. Right? Why does it take a while? And we're also going to want to know why it's so painful to come back from that and why it's so painful to be in that recession. So in order to answer these questions, I'm going to introduce an equation here that's going to be the second most important equation in this class so far. Right, the first most important equation is the real nominal formula. And this is going to build on that to some extent. But this is going to be essentially our E equals MC squared for macroeconomics. Right, it's going to be the most important accounting identity that you'll be keeping track of. This is going to be MV equals PY. Right? That's our, what we call the equation of exchange. And what this tells us is that expenditures equal income. Every time you spend money, that money is going to be somebody else's income. And every time somebody gets income, that's money that got spent by somebody else. So just like e equals MC squared gives you a law of conservation of mass and energy, this is going to be our law of conservation of expenditure. Hopefully when I explain this, it sounds pretty obvious. Right? And that's good if it does. But remember from the very beginning of the class when we talked about the difference between micro and macro. Right? Micro doesn't have to worry about this. Micro doesn't have to worry about conserving expenditure. Right? If demand shifts in one market, where does that expenditure come from, that extra expenditure? Well, we don't have to worry about that, right? We can kind of assume that it comes in small parts from lots and lots of different markets that doesn't affect all of them very much. Right? But we're dealing with big markets here. We can't rest on that assumption. So we're going to have to keep track of expenditures and income. And that's going to tell us uh, what kinds of effects various shocks to the economy are going to have both in the long run and in the short run. And the equation of exchange is a way of keeping track of that expenditure and showing how shocks work their way through the economy. So let's talk about what these variables mean. All right, first of all, M is going to be our money supply. V is going to be our velocity of money. And we've already seen the other two. P is going to be our price level. And Y, little y, notice, it's a little y, so we're going to be talking about real income. And we'll talk in a lot of detail about each of these. Right? And for each of these, we're going to want to know, first of all, how is it defined? How do we get it? Second, how is it measured? Right? How do we figure out an estimate for the economy? And third, what are the units on it? Right? What is it that we're measuring? When we say that m is such and such, such and such what? Or velocity is 3 what? So let's start with m. Right, we're going to have quite a lot to say about M, and then we'll kind of skip over uh, P and Y and uh, say just a little bit about them, because we've seen them quite a bit already. And then we'll spend a little bit of time on velocity and then tie it all back together. So M is our money supply. And the money supply, it's the total quantity of media of exchange in an economy. Right, fairly straightforward. Now, there are a few wrinkles with defining the money supply. All right, first of all, we're going to have to talk about several different types of money. When we talked about trade and money at the beginning of class, we talked about uh, bullion, commodity, fiat, uh, redeemable money. Right, and we 
kind of talked about those as if they were progressive stages. And to some extent that's true, but to some extent these are going to coexist in an economy as well. So the first kind of money that we want to talk about, and these are, again, these are types of money that all exist at the same time in an economy. The first type of money that we want to talk about is what's called base money. Now base money can be either commodity money, like gold, or fiat money, like dollars today. And what do we mean by base money? Base money is money which is not a promise to pay anything. Right? So a lot of money is money because it's a promise to pay something else. Right? Base money is not. Base money is just money in its own right. So during the gold standard, gold was base money because gold is valuable in itself. Right? It's valuable because people demand it for its own sake. Right? It's not a promise to something else. Today, Federal Reserve money, the dollar bills in your wallet are base money because again, those are not a promise to anything. They used to be during the gold standard, but they are no longer. So today those are base money. They're money in their own right. Now the second type of money that we have in our economy today is what's called fiduciary money. And fiduciary money is going to correspond to redeemable money. Now if any of you are in the Marines or know a Marine, you know the phrase Semper Fi, which stands for Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And that word Fidelis comes from the Latin word for faith. Same root word as this word fiduciary. So fiduciary money is a promise, right? It's a promise to pay. And you have to have faith that that promise is going to be kept. So during the gold standard, Federal Reserve notes were fiduciary money. Because if you had a dollar bill, that was a promise to pay gold. You could walk into the Federal Reserve or a bank and say, I would like this amount in gold. And they would give it to you, right? Because it represents a promise to do that. Today, that's base money. Today, you can't do that. But we still have fiduciary money of some sort. Bank issued money is fiduciary money. Now, all of you probably have checking accounts or savings accounts, right? And the money in your checking account is not dollar bills. When you deposit money, the bank doesn't take that and then just sit on it and put it in a vault and wait for you to come back for it, right? That's not what they do. What they do is they use that money and loan it out for productive projects in the economy. And then they give you a promise to pay, right? So they've promised to pay you on demand whatever you have in your checking account. Right? But it's not the same as that money itself. So let me give you an example here. This is a $20 bill from, what is this, 1929 versus a dollar bill today, or $20 bill today. And the $20 bill from 1929, you can see that it has language on it that says, will pay to the bearer on demand, $20. What does that mean? That means that this dollar bill is a promise to some amount of gold. You take it to the bank and they will pay to the bearer of this bill on demand $20 worth of gold. And it's defined in terms of some amount of gold. So that makes this fiduciary money. It's a promise to pay. The $20 bill from today doesn't say that. Right? It has different language. The $20 bill from today says this note is legal tender for all debts public and private. What does that mean? That means that this is not a promise to anything. Right? This means that it's money in its own right and that you can use it for anything that you use money for. So that makes this $20 bill base money. Right? Not a promise to pay. Right? So there's been a shift uh, sometime since 1929 that we'll talk about uh, later on in a little bit more detail. Now because we have different types of money coexisting in the same economy, this actually implies that we can measure the money supply several different ways, depending on what we include or don't. Right? We can have a broad measure of the money supply or a narrow measure. And we're going to talk about three different measures today. Right, the first measure is going to be what we call M0. Now M0 is only going to include base money or money that's directly issued by the central bank. Right, usually those are not going to be different. Now M0 is going to be directly issued by the Federal Reserve. It's going to be under the direct control of the central bank. 
right? So the cash in your pocket and bank reserves are going to be part of M0. But M0 is very far from all the money that you use or even the majority of the money you use. What proportion of transactions that you make do you make in cash? Right? So we're going to want to measure money a little bit more broadly very often. And the first broader measure is what we're going to call M1. M1 is going to include base money, but it's also going to include the money in your checking accounts. Right? Again, the checking accounts are not representations of money sitting in the bank's vaults that they're just waiting for you to come back for, right? It's money in its own right because it's a promise to base money, right? They've promised to give you base money. And it's money itself as well because you can spend it, right? You don't have to convert it into cash before you spend it. If you swipe your debit card, you're spending bank money. So the way you want to think about M1 is that M1 is all the money in the economy that's immediately available for people to spend. Right? You can immediately spend cash. You can immediately swipe your debit card and transfer that promise to somebody else without cash intermediating between that. Right? So your medium of exchange is that promise. It's not dollar bills here. Now we can even go broader than that. Right? Because in addition to your cash and your checking accounts, you also have things like savings accounts and mutual funds, right? So M2 is going to include these things that are maybe a little more difficult to spend, right? You can't spend it immediately. You can't swipe a debit card on your uh, savings account, but you can log on to your bank's website, transfer the money, and then spend it, right? So for all intents and purposes, people think of that as part of their money balances. When people are making financial decisions, they think of it as part of the money that's available to them because it's very easy for them to turn it into something that can be spent. So think of M2 like this. Think of M2 like the amount of money that people could very easily get a hold of if they needed to. And for all intents and purposes is part of their money balances. So when I ask you, how much money do you have? You're gonna include the money in your savings account, right? Because for your purposes, that's liquid enough, and you can get a hold of it very easily. So that's what we're interested in economically, right? Because again, remember we want to translate all of these aggregates, all of these equations, everything we want to translate in terms of people's plans and how people make plans. And so the way that these different assets enter into people's plans, and specifically their plans to spend, that's going to be important. And that's why we're interested in uh, all these different things that people treat as money. So let me give you a sense of the magnitudes of these different measures. So as of this month, March 2020, M0 is about 3.5 trillion. And this is pretty unusually high. Right? The Federal Reserve since 2008 has increased uh, the supply of base money by about five times. Uh, and that's gone down a little bit since then, but uh, prior to that, it was only about 800 billion, so fairly small. M1, if we include checking accounts, that's going to bring us up to $4 trillion. Usually the ratio between these is going to be a lot larger, but uh, since 2008, it's been actually a much smaller ratio. And we'll talk about the significance of that ratio uh, later on when we talk about the money multiplier. But M2 is much bigger than either of the other two. Why? Because making that money a little less mobile, locking it up just a little bit, not too much, but just enough to make it useful for the bank to be able to loan out at longer terms. Right? By locking it up just a little bit, you give the bank the ability to plan for longer term loans and to use that money more productively. So why do you put money in a savings account? Well, presumably because you want to get more interest on it, right? So the benefits to the bank of being able to use that money productively then are passed on to you in the form of interest. And so most of the money that people don't need immediately available to spend, but they want liquid enough that they could spend it very quickly, 
and most of that money is going to be held in the form of M2. So you can see that in general, the vast majority of the money that people are using in an economy isn't actually issued by the Federal Reserve at all. Right? These are promises to pay in terms of Federal Reserve notes, but they are not Federal Reserve money themselves. They're issued by the banks. So we could, in principle, go even bigger. Right? We could include more things than even savings accounts or mutual funds. Right? For example, you could include treasury bonds or stocks or corporate bonds or things like that. Things that you might have to work a little harder to turn into liquid cash. Right? So you can imagine a spectrum of assets based on how difficult they are to spend. Right? On the far side is going to be something like cash. Cash is very easy to spend. Then M1, your checking account. You swipe your debit card, very easy to spend. M2, your savings accounts, very easy to turn into something that you can spend. Treasury bonds, well, you might have to work a little harder. Right? You might not necessarily know before you make the transaction how much exactly you can turn that into in terms of liquid cash. Right? Stocks are going to be even less liquid in that sense. And on the far end on this side, we're going to have things like houses. Right? A house is part of your wealth. If you have a nice house, that makes you wealthy. But a house is not something that you can very easily turn into liquid cash. Right? In fact, it's a very long and arduous process. And you have to wait a long time and do a lot of work in order to do that. And if you need to get rid of it very quickly, right, you're going to make a big loss on that. So houses are part of your wealth, but very much not money. Right? So to some extent, where we draw the line between money on the one hand and non-money on the other hand, to some extent that's somewhat arbitrary. But because we're interested in how people plan for spending decisions, we're going to be able to use M2 as a pretty good balance, usually. Right? M2 is broad enough that it gives us a sense of what people feel like they have available to them to spend when they make their spending decisions. Right? Again, when I ask you how much money you have, you're probably going to think of your cash, checking accounts, and savings accounts. Right? So that's what makes M2 a good measure and broad enough, but not so broad that we're confusing uh, the money supply with wealth in general. Right? Because that's not going to be something that's very uh, useful for talking about business cycles. So if you're really interested in the nitty-gritty of how we decide what to put into the money supply and how we add them together, right, we'll cover that if you take either money and banking or intermediate macro with me. Uh, but for our purposes, M2 will do good enough. Now let's talk about the units on M. Right, if M measures the number of dollars in an economy, right, it's our money supply, the units on M are going to be dollars. Right? Makes sense. So when we say that the money supply is 3 trillion or 4 trillion, 4 trillion what? 4 trillion dollars. Or if we're in Europe, that's going to be euros or yen in Japan. And so because we have dollar units or money units on our money supply, we can do the same thing we can do with anything else that takes dollar units as well. Namely, talk about real money supply and nominal money supply. Now what does that get us? Well, it doesn't just let us compare the money supply over time, like it does GDP. Right? It does do that, but it's going to be more significant for us. Because when we talk about the real money supply, or uh, real money demand, right, this is going to be a much more useful way of talking about the demand for money. Now when we talk about the demand for money, what we're talking about is specifically the demand to hold money. Right? You think to yourself, well, you know, everybody demands money, I'll take as much money as you give me. But the demand for goods right, is the demand to give up money to get goods. Right? So you have to give up something in order to get it. So when we talk about the demand for money, we're talking specifically about the demand to hold money and not spend it. Right? So it's kind of the opposite of the demand for goods. Right? You're giving up the potential to buy goods in order to hold money and not spend it. So why would you do that? Why would you hold money? 
The reason people hold money is because they have a demand for the services of money. Now, what do we mean by the services of money? The services of money are the functions of money that we talked about earlier. Right? When we talk about money being a medium of exchange or a store of value, right, these are functions or services of money that make money useful to people. To get through life, you need some amount of media of exchange. So you're going to demand money today to be able to spend it tomorrow. People demand stores of value. Right? You're going to want to save some amount of money, have it relatively available to you, but maybe put it in a savings account. And so you're going to hold money in order to postpone your consumption to some unspecified later date, and then use it as a medium of exchange later. So think of it this way. When your demand for money falls, you demand to hold less money. So if you were to suddenly demand to hold less money, how would you do that? Well, you'd spend it, right? So when your demand for money falls, your spending is going to increase and your demand for goods is going to increase. By the same token, when your demand for money rises, how do you get more money to hold? Well, you stop spending. You let your money balances accumulate as you get income and then don't spend it. Right? So your demand for goods is going to fall when your demand for money rises. Now here's a way to keep, uh, keep this straight in your head. If any of you have seen A Christmas Carol with, uh, with Mickey Mouse, right? this is Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck opens up the uh, Christmas Carol movie and he's uh, working as a tax accountant and he's employing Mickey as his, uh, as his assistant. And the, they're all shivering in the, uh, in the office, and the lights are dim, because Scrooge McDuck isn't willing to spend the money on the coal to heat the office, right? or to light the office. And what he'd rather do is he'd rather just sit there at his desk and count coins. And then he's got a big vault in his mansion where he goes diving in his coins. Right? So he doesn't want to spend that. He's thrifty. He's frugal. He has a high demand for money but a low demand for goods. Right? He's not willing to spend that money on goods. On the other hand, this is Daisy Duck. Daisy Duck likes to go shopping. Right? She would rather have the stuff than the money. Right? So Daisy Duck has a low demand for money, but a high demand for goods. Right? Now, these are opposites, remember. Why are they opposites? Because of Walras's law. Walras's law tells us that an increase in the demand for one thing implies a decrease in the demand for something else. Right? The demand's got to come from somewhere. Right? So if you're increasing your demand for money, you've got to decrease your demand for goods, and vice versa. That's why those are opposites. So if you remember this diagram, this is our schematic diagram of the macroeconomy. And if you'll remember, the markets are not the boxes. Right? The markets are the arrows that connect the boxes. Right? Markets are two-sided. So in particular, we're interested in these two here, money and goods. Right? And the market for goods, in terms of money, is going to be mediated by the price level. Right? So the price level is going to play a big role here. So because these markets are two-sided, right, if the demand for money rises, the demand for goods is going to have to fall and vice versa. Something can't just affect one of these boxes. You have to at least affect two of them. So here's what real money gets us. Right? Why would we want to talk about the real money supply or real money demand? And how does that help us? Well, first of all, let's figure out how to calculate that. Right? The same formula is going to be used for the real money supply as for any other real nominal pair. And just like GDP, where we had a capital Y for nominal GDP and a lowercase y for real GDP, we divide by the price level to get there. Right? Similarly, we're going to have our nominal money supply be denoted by a capital M and our real money supply denoted by a lowercase m. And we divide the nominal money supply by the price level in order to get that. Now what does this tell us? Well, the real money supply is going to be a reflection of how useful money is to people in general. So imagine you wake up tomorrow and all the prices in the world have doubled. You'd need twice as much money just to do the same things, right? 
And so if you had twice as much money in your bank account, you don't say, well, hey, I'm, I'm richer now. I'm going to go and spend more money. No, you don't say that. Why not? Because you need more money in order to do the same things. So the things that you need to do with money, that's what you want to think of as your real demand for money. Right? So now you demand twice as much nominal money just to do the same things. Right? Because your nominal demand for money had to go up even though your real demand for money stayed the same. You're still planning to do the same amounts of things, but each unit of money is now less useful to you because prices are now higher. Right? So if prices rise, you're going to need more money in order to manage that. So let's come back to the, the price level. Let's interject here with a review of what we've already learned about the price level. Now the price level does show up in our equation of exchange. And we're going to be able to use a lot of what we've learned about real and nominal to manipulate the equation of exchange and to get insights out of it. Right? So the units on the price level, if you remember, are current year dollars per base year dollar. So if the price level today is two and a half. Two and a half what? Two and a half current year dollars equals the value of one dollar in our base year, which would be 1983. Right? The dollar is now less valuable today, and so it takes more dollars, two and a half, to equal the value of one dollar in 1983, our base year. Right? So our units are current year dollars per base year dollar. So when we divide the money supply by the price level, what we're doing is we're converting current year dollars into base year dollar units. And so what we're asking here is something like, what would your demand for money be if the price level stayed the same? And so we're converting it into base year dollar units uh, in order to abstract not only from changes in the value of the money unit over time, but from changes in how useful money is to you. Because that's what the price level really affects is the usefulness of money to you. So we're correcting for that and we're able to say that your real demand for money stays the same even in a lot of cases where you demand more money in nominal terms. So the nominal money supply asks how many dollars are there floating around there in the economy? Right? How many media of exchange exist? And the nominal money supply is sort of kind of controlled by the central bank. Right, the central bank directly controls M0, uh, but it kind of indirectly controls M1 and M2, right? or at least it has strong influence over those. Now the real money supply, on the other hand, is going to index how useful money is to people in general. It's going to keep track of the services of money that exist in the economy. Right? So if the price level goes up, money becomes less valuable. Now you need more money to do the same amount of stuff, and so the services provided by a unit of money decline when the price level goes up. So the real money supply is actually controlled by the demand for money. Right? Who controls the real money supply? Well, it's not the central bank in the long run. Right? It's you and me. Now how does that work? How can it be true at the same time that the central bank controls the nominal money supply but the real money supply is controlled by your and my demand for money. Well, think about it this way. Think back to our real nominal money supply formula. Right, if capital M, if the nominal money supply is determined by the central bank, and lowercase m, the real money supply, is determined by the demand for money, we have a free variable. Those two are related, and we get to lowercase m by dividing capital M by P. And P is going to be our free variable, right? the price level. Right? So the price level is going to adjust so that whatever the central bank wants the nominal money supply to be, and whatever the real money supply is determined by our demand for money, right, the price level is going to adjust so that our real nominal money supply equation is true. Let me give an example of this. So suppose the central bank increases the supply of money. So we're going to have capital M rising. There's now more money in the economy than there was before. But suppose that the demand for money didn't go up. Right? So now there's all this money in the economy, 
where if you get extra money, people are saying, well, I have as much as I demand, so this extra money, I'm going to spend it. I'd rather have the goods at this price level. So the real demand for money didn't go up. Right? So what happens? Well, we're keeping small m the same. Big M rose. What else has to change? Well, the price level has to go up. Right? That's the only thing that can change at this point. So this gives us our very basic theory of inflation. If the nominal money supply goes up and the demand for money doesn't go up, the real money supply in the long run is not going to go up. So the price level has to go up to make this match. Now you think to yourself, okay, well that makes sense algebraically, but who cares about the equation? Why, why, did, why is this equation valid? And that's a valid point. All the equations that we use in macroeconomics, or in economics in general, right, are not just there for their own sake. They're there because they represent the actions and the plans that people are actually taking on the ground. And in order to tell a compelling story, we're going to have to be able to translate this equation and all of our equations into a story of what people are doing on the ground. Right? It makes sense in terms of the plans people are actually making. So let's do that now. Right, what's actually going on in people's heads and in people's plans when the money supply increases like this? So imagine we have an economy. And in this economy, everybody has a demand for money of five weeks of income. That's enough to make them feel pretty safe. So if anybody gets more than five weeks worth of income, they say to themselves, well, you know, the money's great, but I'd rather have the goods, so they spend it. If anybody gets less than five weeks of income in uh, money balances, they're going to say, well, I'm feeling a little uh, unsafe here. I'm going to hold off spending until I build that back up to five weeks. All right, so people are trying to maintain this kind of set point of five weeks of income, and that's their demand for money. So suppose that everybody's pretty well satisfied. Everybody's got their five weeks of income and uh, are happy with that. And now the central bank is going to deploy some helicopters. And out of these helicopters, they're going to airdrop money just over the entire economy. And so people are going to be picking up money just off the street. And they're going to be able to spend that. So if you're pretty happy, with the amount of money that you have right now, you've got your five weeks of income, and all of a sudden, helicopters fly overhead and drop $1,000 in your yard. What are you going to do when you pick that up? Well, you're probably going to go shopping, right? You're satisfied with the amount of money you have. It's sufficient for the plans that you're trying to make. And so if you get more money on top of that, you'd rather have the goods. Right? So your demand for goods is going to increase now. You're going to go to the store and try to spend that off and get back down to five weeks of income. So now let's flip perspectives here. Now imagine yourself not as a person picking up the money, but the shop owner. Right? Suppose you own a bakery and you open up your store one day and all these people come pouring in. And they say, hey, there's helicopters outside giving out free money. You know, we'd like to spend some of that, right? So a croissant sounds great right now. What can you give me? And you say, hey, this is awesome, right? More, uh, more business, more money. And so you start to uh, work a little overtime. Right? You work a little harder. Maybe you try to uh, hire a new, new employee. And you try to buy more materials the longer this goes on. Right, now what's the problem? Well, just as you're trying to hire new help to meet this demand, well, the store next door is also trying to hire somebody else. Right? And all the stores are trying to hire new people to meet this extra demand. Right, so the price of labor is going to have to go up. What else is happening? You're trying to get more flour. Right? And the flour company hasn't gotten any more productive. Right? The same amount of wheat is now being grown in the U.S. And the supply of wheat hasn't gone up, but the demand for it has. So what's the flour company going to have to do? You're demanding more flour. All the other bakeries in the country are demanding more flour. And so they're going to have to raise their prices. So all of a sudden, you're facing higher labor costs, 
higher materials costs. Well, all of a sudden, you can't keep selling your croissants for the same price. You're going to have to raise your prices for it to be worth it for you to keep selling those. So you raise your prices. And all these people who are crowding into your shop go, well, you know, I really only wanted a croissant because I had this extra money. But if it's going to be, you know, $4 rather than $2, maybe I don't want one. And this is going to happen until the same amount of people who would be buying croissants anyway are going to be the ones who keep buying croissants. Everybody else, right, prices have risen to the point that they're going to need the extra money in order to just do the th same things that they were doing before. All right, so you raise your prices, everybody else raises their prices, and all these other people with the extra money in their pockets are now willing to hold that money because now they need it in order to do the same things that they were doing before. All right, so that's our basic theory of inflation in terms of the plans people are actually making. Right? It's the same story as the one with the equation, but it's in terms of you know, what people are actually doing. So in general, in this story, the supply of money rose, but the demand for money didn't. Right? So the real money supply, in the long run, is going to go back to where it was, right? because people are going to spend the excess. Anything that they don't demand, they're going to try to spend. And if everybody's trying to spend all that excess money, the demand for goods is going to rise, right? But the supply of goods didn't rise. So if the demand rises and the supply doesn't, well, prices have got to rise too. And once prices rise all across the economy, right, all this excess money is no longer excess money. And you need that in order to keep doing the things you want to do. So when the price level rises, the demand for nominal money rises. Right? Equilibrium happens when all the money in the economy is demanded by somebody. And prices are going to adjust either up or down until all the money is demanded by somebody. Because if it's not, people are going to still keep trying to spend that excess money and prices are going to keep rising until somebody's willing to hold all that money. So when does this happen? When would the money supply rise like this? Well, if you remember from when we were introduced to Fred, and we saw that inflation was really high in the US in the 1970s. Why did this happen? Well, who was president during the 1970s? Richard Nixon. All right, so we have a tape of Nixon calling up the chairman of the Fed and saying something like, well, my relations with the Fed will be different than they were with Bill Martin. He was always six months too late doing anything, and I'm counting on you, Arthur, to keep us out of a recession. What's he saying here? He's saying, hey, election year's coming up. And if there's a recession in an election year, that's bad news for the incumbent president. So I'm going to need you to expand the money supply. Make sure that we have enough money flowing through the economy to avoid a recession. Now, ideally, what would you like the chairman of the Fed to say? Well, you'd like him to say, well, yeah, buzz off. But at this time, the president had the power to fire the chairman of the Fed. And so what does Arthur Burns have to do? He says, yes, Mr. President, I don't like to be late. So he does it. Right? He expands the money supply and pumps all this money into the economy. And what happens? We get inflation, just like our story predicted. So the same thing happens in the opposite direction, too. So suppose the money supply goes down, and we have a fall in the nominal money supply. But people are still demanding the same amount of money in real terms. right? So people don't want to hold less money. And so the real supply of money in the long run is going to stay the same. What has to change? Well, the price level has to fall. We get deflation. So let's tell this story in terms of people on the ground again. And instead of helicopters distributing money, imagine we have a vacuum cleaner, a giant vacuum cleaner. Have you seen the movie uh, Spaceballs, classic uh, Mel Brooks movie? This is a uh, Mega Maid, a spaceship that's designed to suck the uh, atmosphere out of this planet. Right? In this case, we're imagining it's sucking money out of people's pockets. So now you wake up and you have half the money in your bank account and in your pocket that you did the night before. What do you do? Well, you say to yourself, 
this really puts a crimp in my plans. I was planning to take my girlfriend to Applebee's. I was maybe planning to uh, buy a car at the uh, end of the school year. So what do you do now? Well, you want to rebuild your money balances. Right? You want to stop spending in order to get back to the amount of money that makes you feel safe again. So you say, hey baby, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to cancel Applebee's, maybe I'll take you to Chick-fil-A. Maybe instead of buying a new car at the end of graduation, maybe I'm gonna buy a used car, or maybe I'm gonna postpone that for another year. So all these spending decisions, you're gonna have to revise, and now you're gonna have to spend less in order to get back to that amount of money that you demand in real terms. Now if everybody's doing this, prices are gonna have to fall. I'd imagine this from the perspective of the baker again. You open up your shop and all of a sudden nobody comes in. And you say, oh, well, this isn't good. I've got these uh, croissants. They're going to spoil. Right? I can't sit on these forever. So what am I going to have to do? What am I going to do with these croissants? Well, I'm going to have to cut the price right, in order to get everybody back in here. All right, so maybe you... Uh, decrease your demand for labor, so the price of labor falls. You decrease your demand for materials, so the price of materials falls. Same exact story, but in reverse. And as prices fall, real money balances are going to rise, right? because that denominator on the right-hand side is falling. So the left-hand side, our real money supply, is rising. And it's going to rise back to where it was based on real money demand. Right? Because now with lower prices, you can do more with less money. And there's some price level, once prices fall enough, where you're going to feel safe keeping the amount of money that you have now. So when does this happen? Well, we saw how at least one person in politics could have an interest in the money supply rising. Right? We'll talk more about uh, how that happens uh, in a couple units here. But who would have an interest in the money supply falling? Well, nobody really has an interest in it, but it sometimes happens nonetheless. Right, this is a bank run. Right, remember when we talked about bank money being a promise to pay in terms of base money. Now, what happens if you start to doubt that promise? And you think to yourself, well, I don't know if the bank's going to have enough money to pay back that promise, to cover my deposit account. Well, you want to get your money out before everybody else does. And if everybody else has the same thought, you get a run on the bank. Right? So when there's a run on the bank, the bank or hopefully has enough assets to cover that in the long run. But some of that's tied up in loans. And the bank's not going to be able to get everybody's money back until it's able to call in those loans. Right? So it can handle normal demand. But if everybody comes in at once, well, it's in trouble. And so if it's not able to satisfy that demand, if it's not able to redeem those promises, if everybody comes in at once, right, the bank goes bankrupt. And how much is a promise worth to an entity that no longer exists or is bankrupt? Not that much, right? So all of these promises, all of these checking accounts that used to be money, that people used to be able to spend, are now no longer money. Right? This was a big problem during the Great uh, depression. The supply of base money never fell, but there were a lot of bank failures. Right? And these bank failures caused the supply of M2 to fall by a good 33%. And that's a big part of the reason why the Great Depression was so severe. So let's put all this together. When we put all this together, what we get is something called the quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money is a hypothesis that in the long run, prices are going to change in direct proportion to the change in the money supply. Now again, this is a hypothesis, whereas the equation of exchange was an accounting identity, which is true by definition at all times. Right? So the quantity theory of money makes an assumption and says if the demand for money is relatively stable, then the price level is going to absorb changes in the money supply. Now, this is Milton Friedman, who was important in developing the quantity theory of money, and he has a quote that says, a famous quote, saying, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. 
What does he mean? Well, what he means is that it's a relatively good assumption that the demand for money is pretty stable. Right? It's not perfectly stable. You're going to get maybe one or two percentage points uh, wiggle room around zero. But when you see things like 10% inflation, or 100% inflation, or 10 million percent inflation, it's a pretty good bet that what's going on there is not the demand for money. It's changes in the money supply. Right? So every time you see big inflation like that, you can bet that the something's up with the money supply. So let me show you how this works. Let's start with our real nominal formula for the money supply. Right, we have our lowercase m equals uh, big M over P. And we know how to convert this formula to growth rates. Right, if we want to find the growth rate of the real money supply, we're going to take the same formula and we're going to turn our division into subtraction. So the growth rate of the real money supply is going to be the growth rate of the nominal money supply minus the growth rate of the price level, or inflation. Now the quantity theory is a hypothesis that the growth rate of the real money supply is zero, or the growth rate of real money demand is zero, because in equilibrium money supply is equal to money demand. Right, so this hypothesis is that real money demand is, for all intents and purposes, not really changing. Now if we do algebra on this, we substitute in that delta m equals zero, and we get the rate of change of the nominal money supply minus inflation equals zero, what does that imply? That implies that inflation equals the rate of change of the money supply. Right? So this is a fairly strong hypothesis, but in fact we have a lot of evidence for this. This is a plot of 110 countries. On the vertical axis is inflation, that's going to be the delta P. On the horizontal axis is going to be money supply growth, that's going to be delta M. And if delta M equals delta P, everybody's going to be on that 45 degree line. Now what you'll notice is that not everybody's right on it, right? There's some wiggle room around it, and to the extent that they're off of it, that's going to be changes in money demand one or two percentage points. But they're all very close, right? especially up in that corner. Money demand is not going to be sufficient to drive a huge wedge between or money supply growth and inflation. So anytime you see high inflation or even moderate inflation, that's going to be almost entirely explained by changes in money supply growth. Here's some more evidence. This is, instead of lots of countries at one period of time, this is one country over time. This is the UK. And the blue line is the price level. The orange dotted line is going to be the money supply. And what we see is that these are very close. They track each other very closely. So you see in about 1914 to 1920, big burst of money supply growth, big burst of inflation. That's World War I. Around 1940, you see the money supply going up, price level not quite keeping track because they were doing price controls back then, but it caught up eventually. 1970s, big jump in the money supply growth, big jump in inflation. Same things happening in the UK that was happening in the US during the 70s. Right? We'd all just gotten off the gold standard and didn't really know what to do with ourselves. So the whole world had this big bout of inflation. And then in the 1980s, the U.S. got that under control, and the U.K. got it under control, and uh, things have been have flattened out a little more since then. So we see the same thing in this graph that we saw in the previous graph, is that these two lines don't track each other exactly. Right? There's little wiggle room for changes in money demand. But by and large, what explains most of the movement here is changes in the money supply. Right? Anytime you see big changes in inflation, that's going to be due to changes in the money supply. So how often does the demand for money change after all? Right, and some of this is going to depend on how you measure money. Right, you can imagine your demand for cash versus your demand for M1 versus your demand for M2, and those might be different. Right, and that's going to matter later on when we talk about financial panics. Right? People in financial panics are going to demand different kinds of money, 
but not necessarily more money, right? So the broader we measure the money supply and the more correctly we measure it, what we find is that the more stable money demand is. Right? And the more closely the price level is going to track changes in the money supply. So it's going to work better if we measure changes in M2 than if we measure changes in M1. And there's even some others that we'll talk about in intermediate macro where changes in that money supply, that measure of the money supply, works even better. All right, suppose that we do have a change in the demand for money then. Suppose that the demand for money falls. Now, are we going to be spending money now or holding money? Well, we're going to be spending more money. Right? So if the demand for money in real terms falls, people are going to decide to be spending more and increase their demand for goods and decrease their demand for money. So prices are going to have to rise if the central bank doesn't change the money supply. Right? So P is going to have to go up in order to maintain that equality. And you can imagine the same kind of story playing out here. Right? People aren't spending more money because they got more money. People are spending more money just because they decided to. Right? But the effect is the same. Price level is going to rise. Now the quantity theory says that this case is probably not going to be that important. Right? And in general, it's not. Right? There's going to be a few special cases where it is that we'll talk about in, the, in a couple units. Uh, but in general, this is not going to be a very significant driver of changes in the price level. Same thing in reverse. Right? If the demand for money rises, if people all of a sudden demand more money and they would rather hold more money, then the price level is going to have to fall. Right? Again, for exactly the same story. Not that people now have woken up with less money, but people have just decided to spend less. And again, the quantity theory says this is not going to be a very important case, except in certain very special uh, situations that we'll talk about uh, later on. So that about covers us for the M part of the equation of exchange. Right? So we've said quite a lot about the first letter there, just that big M. And we've said a little bit about P already. And we've seen P all throughout the semester, so we'll, we'll say we've covered that adequately. Just a little bit more to say about real income. Right, we've seen real income and nominal income before, but we'll just uh, relate it to this a uh, little more explicitly. So if you remember, our capital Y is our nominal GDP. Right? Y equals C plus I plus G plus X. Right? That's going to be our nominal income. And the units on that are going to be dollars per time or dollars per year. And we're going to be able to convert to real GDP by dividing by the price level. And when we divide by the price level, we're going to convert from current dollars per time units to base year dollars per time units. All right, so remember this is a flow. Right? GDP tells you a flow of money in a period of time, in this case a year. Right? It's not just a dollar measure, but it's dollars per time. And for us, this is going to measure an economy's productive capacity, noting, of course, all the caveats that we talked about when we talked about GDP. Right? When we talked about, remember, productivity improvements, basket changes, things like that. But in general, we'll do OK to think of real GDP as the productive capacity of an economy. Now our second letter, in fact, the last letter, we've kind of saved this for last, is going to be what we call the velocity of money. Velocity measures the number of times that a dollar gets spent in a year. All right, so imagine this. I spend a dollar at the grocery store. And that dollar is used by the store to pay its cashier. Now the cashier is going to be able to use that dollar to go get a haircut. And the barber is going to be able to use that same dollar to maybe pay his telephone bill. All right, so the same dollar, every time it gets spent, is somebody else's income. And the number of times that happens in a year is going to be our velocity of money. Now we'll talk in a little bit about why this matters, but first of all I want to talk about the units. How do we measure the velocity of money, or what are we measuring when we measure it? So if you remember, any time we have an equation, the units on the two sides have to match. Right? We do algebra on those units, and they have to match between the two sides. Otherwise, we don't have an equality. 
Right, so here's our equation of exchange. And the units on MV are going to equal the units on PY. So remember, as we saw, that the units on M are dollars. Right? It's just a measure of dollars in the economy. Our price level we've seen many times during the semester so far. Our price level is going to be a ratio of current year dollars to base year dollars. And our real income, because it's real income, is going to have units of base year dollars per time. Right? We just saw that. We take, took our current year dollars per time in nominal GDP, divided it by the price level to get base year dollars per time for real GDP. So this being the case, we're going to be able to use this to figure out what do the units on velocity have to be. So if we multiply mv, we're going to get uh, the units on m is dollars times the units on v, whatever those are. So dollars times something. And that's going to have to equal the units on py. So what are the units on py? Well, we have a base year dollar in the numerator and a base year dollar in the denominator on p. We cancel those out and multiply those together. And what we get is that the units on py are dollars per time, right? current year dollars per year. And so if we have dollars times something equals dollars per time, well, that something is going to be 1 over time. Right? So the units on velocity are going to be 1 divided by time. What the heck does that mean? It's not really intuitive. What would it mean to measure something in inverse time units? Well, think of it this way. If the units on M are dollars, the units on MV are going to be dollars per time, or a flow of dollars. So when you multiply them together, you get a flow of dollars, or a flow of spending. Just the same as on the right-hand side, right? GDP, our nominal GDP, is going to be our flow of spending. So on the right-hand side, that nominal GDP, or our income, is going to equal the dollars that people are spending throughout the economy. On the left-hand side, that's going to equal the flow of spending that arises from M dollars. Right? So M dollars flows through the economy at such and such a rate, MV rate. So if we take out the M, Velocity means the rate at which $1 flows through the economy. Right? If mv is the rate at which m dollars flows through the economy, v is going to be the rate at which $1 flows through the economy. So what does that per time mean? What does that divided by time mean? When we say that v is 2, 2 what? 2 per year. So a velocity of 2 would mean that the average dollar gets spent two times in a year. Now, one other thing I want to emphasize too is that velocity and the demand for money are very closely related. And you can see this if you rearrange the equation of exchange. Now, I would encourage you to follow along here with a uh, scratch pad and start with the equation of exchange and rearrange until you see and can verify what I've done here. Because right, this will help you see what we're doing. So if we take our equation of exchange, mv equals py, and we uh, divide both sides by m, solve for v, what we get is v equals py over m, and that gives us y divided by m over p, which is our real money supply. So the velocity of money is going to be the ratio between real income and the demand for money, the long-run demand for money. Right, so because we're dealing in the short run, we're going to say that real income, we're not going to worry about that. We're not going to imagine that's changing. Right? We're interested in that changing over the long run when we talk about economic growth. But for now, we're just talking about 5 to 20 year intervals. And we're just going to put that to the side right now. So you can imagine that the velocity of money is the inverse of the demand for money. Right, multiplied by real GDP. So if the demand for money rises, people are going to be holding on to money and not spending it. And if people are not spending it, then velocity is going to fall. The number of times that it changes hands per year is going to fall. Right, so you can see that if 
the little m in the denominator rises, v on the left hand side is going to have to fall. Same thing in reverse. If the demand for money falls, if little m falls, people are now going to be spending more money. They're going to rather spend it than hold it. So when they spend it, and they're going to be more likely to spend it, that means that the number of times that a dollar gets spent in a year, that's going to rise. So the demand for money falling means that velocity is going to rise. Right? So don't just memorize that fact. Right? I'm not necessarily interested in you just memorizing facts here. Right? And you're going to get confused with rising and falling and what's opposite, what's the same. Right? You're going to want to keep track of the logic of this. Right? So think through in your head. Be able to work this out, the logic of it. Say, if the demand for money is changing, what's that doing to the number of times that a dollar gets spent in the economy? That's how you work it out. And that's how I would recommend keeping this straight for the purposes of exams and uh, through life in general. So now let's come back to the volume of spending. Right, we talked about the volume of spending very briefly at, in our basic concepts in macro. And now we're going to be able to come back to that. Now we have the tools to really make use of this. So if you remember, the volume of spending is the rate of flow of dollars through an economy over a period of time. And the measure of this is going to be GDP, right? which is our capital Y. That's a measure of the volume of spending. In this case, that's also equal to P times little y. Right? You can do algebra on the real nominal formula and verify that. And our equation of exchange tells us that that's equal to the money supply times the velocity of money. Now, this tells us something very interesting here. This tells us that if the volume of spending is going to change, if nominal GDP is going to change, right? the right hand side of the equation of exchange is nominal GDP, so if that changes, we're going to need either a change in the money supply or a change in money demand. Right? So we're going to either need to change the number of dollars in the economy or the rate at which they're flowing through the economy. Right? And remember how money demand is related to velocity. Right? That's how we get that. So if the supply of money isn't changing, and the demand for money isn't changing, the volume of spending isn't changing. And this is going to be important later on when we talk about monetary and fiscal policy. So when people tell you that such and such will stimulate the economy because it uh, increases spending, right? well, right, is it going to change the money supply, or is it going to change money demand? If it doesn't change either one, it's not going to be stimulative. It's not going to change the volume of spending. One example of this that people very often uh, talk about is, for example, the minimum wage. Right? People will say something like, well, minimum wage will increase the amount of money in the pockets of lower income people, and therefore they'll spend more, and therefore this will stimulate the economy. First of all, this is going to be a short run effect that we'll talk about later on. Right? So don't worry about that yet. But second of all, does an increase in the minimum wage change the money supply? No, it doesn't. Right? Because this is, all this is doing is mandating that employers pay their employees some amount of money. So it doesn't change money supply. Does it change money demand? Probably not on average, right? You're going to be transferring money from some parties to other parties. It's not systematically changing money demand. Right? So there's not going to be any kind of stimulative effect here. Right, you can imagine that this is going to have uh, real effects. Right, it's going to cause surpluses of labor, unemployment. Right, that's going to be a real effect because you're impeding labor from flowing to its most valued uses. But it's not going to cause inflation. It's not going to be stimulative. Right? And those are the same sort of argument. Right? Inflation and stimulative uh, things are both arguments about the volume of spending. It's not going to work. Right? So be skeptical anytime somebody tells you that something is stimulative. Right? Most of the time, just mere spending is a transfer of spending. It's not a, an increase in spending. So as we near the end here, let me give you a, a few alternate forms of the equation of exchange. And again, I would recommend that you verify that these all work. With a scratch pad, you can do algebra, do uh, multiplication, division. And this is all basic algebra, and you can see that these are all the same equation, just written in different ways. 
So our original is our MV equals PY. This tells us that expenditures equal income. Right, if we combine this with our real nominal formula, if you remember that little y is big Y divided by P, that implies that big Y equals P times little y. And P times little y is our right-hand side of the equation of exchange. So we can write this as MV equals capital Y because capital Y, our nominal income, that's our measure of the volume of spending. Right? So it all comes full circle here. This one we saw earlier when we talked about velocity. Right? This shows us the relationship between velocity and real money demand and shows why those are inversely related. If we solve for the price level and we divide both sides of the equation of exchange by little y, what this tells us is that the price level is going to be the ratio of the volume of spending to real output. Right? So once you've figured out all of these other things, all of these other real factors, then you can figure out what the price level has got to be to make those work. So sometimes you'll hear the volume of spending referred to as aggregate demand. Well, aggregate demand, think of as the, the quantity of goods that people are buying at the current price level. All right, now, aggregate demand can increase temporarily, right, until prices rise. Or it can decrease temporarily until prices fall. So aggregate demand, or volu the volume of spending, is going to be the key element when we explain inflation or deflation. Right? And you get temporary bumps or drops in aggregate demand or in the volume of spending that's going to lead to inflation or deflation. You can also think of lowercase y, our real income, as aggregate supply. Right? How many goods are there that are being produced? Or what is the value of those goods that are being produced? And so what that last equation showed us when we solved for P is that the price level is going to depend not only on aggregate supply, but also aggregate demand. Not only aggregate demand, but also aggregate supply. Right? And in fact, it's the ratio of those two things. Right? Those are going to jointly determine the price level. So if the nominal money supply is determined by the central bank, more or less, and velocity or we can also say little m, right? If one is determined by money demand, then so is the other. And little y, as we saw in our lectures on long run growth, real income is gonna be determined by institutions, productive capacity, things like that. Anytime any of these things change, the price level is gonna have to adjust. All right, so this gives us our kind of maximal theory of inflation of what the price level is going to be doing. Here are all the different factors that can affect the price level. And the quantity theory says that, well, first of all, it's a long run theory. So we're going to say that real money demand isn't changing. Right? So velocity is probably going to be relatively constant. And so M and P are going to be very closely related. Or the growth rate of M is going to be very closely related to the growth rate of P and vice versa. Right, but this gives us our maximal set of factors to account for. Right, the quantity theory tells us which one is important, which one is the most important, but this is our full set. Right, so we can reprise this story. The same story we told with the uh, real and nominal money supply, we're going to be able to tell equally well with the equation of exchange. So if the money supply expands, the volume of spending rises, right? And now people demand more than they want to hold. So the demand for goods rises, aggregate demand rises. And so in order to maintain this, uh, this accounting identity, price level is gonna have to rise. What are people doing on the ground to make this happen? Well, that's the story we told with the baker. So the other three letters, M, V, and little y, are determined by external factors. Right? Central bank determines uh, big M, Money demand, your and my money demand determines velocity. Institutions and productive capacity determine little y. And so anytime any of these change, my price level is going to have to adjust. So nominal income is going to be rising here. Right? Remember the right hand side equals big Y. So that's going to rise. Nominal income is going to rise. But real income, by hypothesis, doesn't. Right? So the growth rate 
of nominal income is going to be the same as the growth rate of the money supply. But if we break that into the growth rate of the price level, which is inflation, and the growth rate of real income, that's going to be entirely the price level. That's going to be all inflation. Similarly, if the demand for money rises, same story we told earlier, just using a uh, different equation to get a different angle on it. If the demand for money rises, little m rises, people are holding money rather than spending it, right? And so the rate of flow of the average dollar throughout the economy is going to fall. Right? If people are holding on to more money, that flow slows. So velocity is going to fall. So the volume of spending is going to fall. And if the volume of spending falls, prices fall. And we get deflation. Right? And the, both of these stories work uh, the same way in reverse, if, uh, if money demand falls, for example. And finally, suppose that we have uh, growth in real income. Suppose that the economy becomes more productive now. So there's more stuff to buy. More stuff is being produced. Right? And in order to manage more transactions, you're going to demand more money. Right? But only in proportion to the growth in real income. Right? It's going to be proportional. And because velocity is the ratio of real money demand to real income, right, if both of those increase proportionately, velocity is going to stay the same. Right? So velocity only tracks the demand for money out of proportion with real income growth. So in this case, the volume of spending stays the same. But prices are going to have to fall. Right? And this makes sense. So if you draw a standard supply and demand diagram, if you increase the supply of something, the price of it falls. It right? makes sense. Same thing in the aggregate. If aggregate supply increases, there's more stuff to buy. Prices are going to have to fall if the money supply doesn't compensate for that. So we're almost to the end here. Let's sum up. What we've got here is a basic theory of inflation and what the price level does in the short run and the long run. All right, so aggregate supply and aggregate demand together are going to jointly determine the price level. And aggregate demand, by the same token, can be affected by either the supply of money, M, or the demand for money, V. So that's about it for our introduction to the equation of exchange. In the next lecture, we'll talk about unemployment. And before then, I'd like you to read chapter 11 of the Modern Principles textbook. And when we get back, we'll, uh, we'll get to talking about uh, some of the symptoms of recessions before we start talking about